the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight's story is a comedy with Andy Griffith as your host. Here's a preview. Citizens of your Huppetsville, I know that you will stay calm, as I will stay calm in this time of crisis. Citizens, we are out of oil. Run for your lives. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Andy Griffith. Yahuppetsville is like most any village, I suppose. Over there on the courthouse is the town clock. I guess that clock has been telling time for as long as anyone can remember around here. It does need repairing ever so often. But next to the village hall, there is the mayor's office. I guess the mayor's office is about the second most important building in the whole village. The first most important building is, is that one. 316 Beanstalk Drive. Just think, 165 stories for the sole purpose of housing one company, Energy Incorporated. I guess Beanstalk Drive is just about the most important street in the whole world. Of course, that's because of one man, Jack, the village hero. I guess he's made Yahuppetsville what it is today. Coming down the street is Jack's chief administrative assistant, Benny. Looks like he's going into a phone booth over there on Gnome Street. Frama? Hey, uh, let me speak to his honor. Mayor? Hey, this is Benny. Jack wants to see you and me over at the 316 building. He thinks we're all in big trouble. Trouble? Trouble? Big trouble? W what are you talking about? Where are you? People will hear you. Don't worry. I'm calling from a pay phone. Pay phone? Jack thinks that we're in big trouble and he wants to see me? Right, right. Now, I make it snappy. And that's only the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis production of the Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Jack and the Energy Crunch, by Michael Utvich and Michael Gelman. Our stars, Les Tremaine, Robert Towers, and Jesse White. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. It appears that Jack, Benny, and the mayor are going to have a little powwow over 316 Beanstalk Drive. Up on the top floor of the Energy Incorporated Tower, Jack is looking pretty upset. Gentlemen? Thank you both for coming on such short notice. As you have probably surmised from the recent rioting and various attempts on my life, I think we might be facing a certain amount of distrust among the peasants. Uh, Jack, may I interrupt for a moment? You just did, Mayor. Uh, Jack, I think the situation is a little more serious than you think. Our popular support has completely eroded away. Of course, the peasants have hated us for years, but we could live with that. After all, they needed Energy Incorporated. But now, the media is advocating revolution. We're talking your basic economic collapse here. They want to string us up and let us cook in the heat of the orb, so to speak. He's right, Jack. At two, Benny. Jack, instead of Evening Symphony, Radio Yohoppetsville is going to broadcast a special report on our entire operation. Nothing we can't handle. Jack, my sources indicate that tonight's broadcast documents the whole story just the way it happened. Benny, turn on the set. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, it shall come to pass that instead of our usual musical program, Radio Yohuppetsville will present a special report. Jack, the Orb, and you. Once upon a time, there was a village called Yohuppetsville. For a long time, peace and tranquility reigned in Yohuppetsville. The people lived out their simple lives working the land. Now, they didn't know they lacked certain necessities, like hair dryers, microwave ovens, and customized dune buggies, for they were an ignorant lot. They were content to idle away their spare time with feasting, dancing, and casino gambling. One day, it came to pass that a local tinkerer named Sam the Tinkerer invented a strange and wondrous thing he called the whiz bang. Sam took his new invention into the village square and set it out for all to see. The mayor spoke to the people. Citizens of your Huppetsville, I give you the man of the hour, Sam the Tinkerer. Hey! 
And so, Sam the Tinkerer turned a strange knob on the whiz-bang, and it suddenly sprang to life, whizzing and banging. <laughs> And the people ooed and awed. Ooh. Ah. And the mayor proclaimed it a special day. I hereby proclaim this Sam the Tinkerer Day. Now, Sam here tells me that this is the dawning of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> the whiz bang became an instant success. Every person in Yohuppetsville wanted a whiz-bang of his own. And the village grew prosperous as the people got more whiz-bangs and more and more still. Soon, nobody in Yohuppetsville could remember what life was like without the whiz-bangs. But there was this one small catch. The more whiz-bangs, the more oil was used up. The mayor spoke to the people. Citizens of Yohuppetsville, we have enough oil to last. For a while. The people paid no attention to oil. They wanted bigger and better whiz bangs. And all seemed copacetic until one day the mayor sorrowfully spoke to the people. Citizens of your Huppetsville, I have a grave announcement to make. I know, I know that you will stay calm, as I will stay calm in this time of crisis. Citizens, we are out of oil. Run for your lives. Now, as luck would have it, Yohuppetsville had a hero in residence. His name was Jack, though most called him Jack the Giant Killer. For in his day, Jack had been as big a hero as any village could ever want. But time is the enemy of youth. And Jack the Giant Killer was no longer able to climb beanstalks or consort with magic demons. So the duties of Hero fell upon Jack's son, Jack Jr. Now, Jack Jr. was a nice enough fellow, but he wasn't exactly the hero type, if you know what I mean. Jack Jr. had never served as a hero before. That sort of duty doesn't come along every day. But the mayor felt he had no recourse but to send for Jack Jr. to bail him out of a very sticky jam. And so it came to pass that Jack found himself in the mayor's office. Jack! Oh, good to see you, boy. Uh, thank you, Your Honor, sir. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, in the old days, Jack, your father and I were very good friends. Do you have any idea how long it took to get rid of that last giant he killed? <laughs> it took so long that... But I guess you've heard all the jokes. <laughs> yes, Your Honor, many times. Uh, Jack, uh, why don't we get right to the point? Uh, excuse me, Your Honor, but I'm not big on being a hero. You see, I'm really a poet. There was a young hero from Trent who had a most unusual... Uh, Jack, uh, like it or not, you are the village hero, and right now, the village really needs a hero. Think of your father. Think of me. Think of the reward. The reward? Well, uh, funds are a little low right now, but I'm sure the village council will see their way clear to slipping the village hero a little something. <laughs> After your return, of course. I will go forth for the villagers, Your Honor, and not for your rewards of gold. Gold? Who said anything about gold? Uh, I, I was thinking maybe a trophy or something. The very next day, Jack and the mayor stood before the villagers. And so, my fellow citizens, before Jack departs on an adventure he may never return from, he wants to say a few words. Um, there aren't many people here, Mayor. Most people had to work, Jack. Even Dad didn't make it. Jack, uh, please say something to the peasants. Time is running out. Very well, Mayor. Ladies and gentlemen... I am going forth to find more energy for our whiz bang. If I don't come back, I would like to leave you with these words. There was a young hero from Trent who had a most unusual... Yeah, yeah, that's great, Jack. I wasn't done yet. Uh, I know. And with that, Jack set forth on his amazing journey. Radio Yohuppetsville will be back in a moment. <laughs> And so Jack set out on his quest to find energy for his village. Now, after he had journeyed for some time, he came upon a small brook where he stopped to rest. 
He had been sitting by the brook for a short time when an old man emerged from the bushes. He had an air of knowledge. He was clothed in white and wore a plastic pencil case in his shirt pocket. Hello, stranger. Hello, Jack. You know my name? Yes, Jack. I know you and I knew your father. You're okay. If you're so wise, old man, what then do I seek? You seek energy for your village. Exactly. And just who are you? I am a wise guy. What's your real name? Jack, you know, a wise guy. The character in fairy tales who points the hero towards truth, justice, and the American way. Oh, a wise guy. Well, I have to be going now. Uh, hold on a minute, Jack. I haven't pointed the way yet. Sorry. Your quest for energy is one that will be filled with great danger. You will find what you seek in the far country beyond the high mountains, Jack. You will travel a long and perilous road. You will encounter dangers you have never dreamed of. That sounds scary. <laughs> it is. You're going to need some kind of magic. Let me look through my bag. Ah, here we go. A magic shield. You mean I got to carry that thing? Uh, maybe you're right. I know. How about a magic stereo component system? I don't know. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Jack. You can keep the magic stereo system, or you can have what's behind the curtain. I'll take the curtain. Oh, you made a wise choice, Jack. Juanita, tell him what he's won. There, before Jack, lay a small, slightly shriveled avocado. That's just a lousy avocado. I hate avocados. It's a lousy magic avocado. And with that, the wise guy disappeared in a cloud of purple smoke. Bizarre. Very bizarre. Jack traveled for several days. And just when he thought he could go no further, he beheld an awesome sight. Below him was a village larger than any Jack had ever seen. Monolith towers reached high into the sky, poking through the great orange and brown clouds which swirled around them. Jack began to walk down the mountain toward the great village. Before long, he came upon a magical sign. 25 miles to the city of Ozone. Gas, food, and lodging next exit. It had been a long journey, and Jack was tired and hungry. Suddenly, he remembered the avocado the wise guy had given him. Jack sat down in a grove of trees just off the road, and as he prepared to peel the avocado with his knife, a voice rang out. Hey, what, what, what are you doing? Who said that? Will you put the knife down and stop cutting into me? I'm going to turn you into a washer-dryer combo. Okay, okay, see? I'm putting the knife down. Yeah, well, that's better. Uh, my name is Benny. I'm a, I'm an avocado. Oh, hello. My name is Jack. I'm a hero. Good gravy. I'm talking to an avocado. And I work on a strict commission basis. So, uh, just give me a plan and let's get going. Time is money, right? Right. I don't really have a plan. Say what? I don't have a plan. Well, I don't know what I'm doing here. Well, this is the city where dwells Consortium, the giant keeper of the oil. There isn't any more oil. Sure there is for a price. Come with me, Jack, and uh, we shall enter the city of Ozone. And so it was that Jack and Benny entered the city of Ozone. They traveled through the city for many hours, until Jack finally spoke. Benny, are you sure we haven't been by this place before? Ah, oh, you crazy kid. Hand me that telephone book. That's a magic book, isn't it, Benny? Sure, that's it, a magic book, yeah. It's a magic guidebook for heroes and avocados and like that, uh -huh. you see? See, look, kid, right here. Yeah. What did I tell you? Consortium the Giant lives in a monolith tower at 48th and 7th. Benny, isn't there an easier way of doing this? Sure. You're right, Jack. <laughs> After all, I'm on an expense account. Yeah. Hey, yo, hey, hey, cab! Soon, Jack and Benny found themselves standing at the base of the monolith tower where dwelt the giant consortium. Benny, I'm scared. Radio Yo Huppetville will be back in a moment. Benny stood at the base of the monolith tower, where dwelt the giant consortium. Listen, Benny, here's my plan. Yeah? We'll kill the giant and steal his golden harp. What are you, nuts? Look, you want a solution to your village's energy problem, right? Right. So you don't want to kill the giant? He's got oil. I want to negotiate with him? Exactly. 
Right, Danny, but we'll just climb up this tower and sneak into the giant's lair. You do what you like, kid, but I'm going to take the elevator and make an appointment with his secretary. Now, as luck would have it, Consortium, the giant, had just returned from lunch and was busy counting his gold. Nine hundred thousand barrels at one hundred and seventeen dollars and sixty-three cents each equals... What's this? Yeah. See, five of them, I smell avocado dip. Benny! Benny the avocado, where are you? Down here on your shoelace? <laughs> Blow me down. I haven't seen you since Tolkien. Frankly, Consortium, uh, I don't think there ever really was a ring. <laughs> Benny, you kill me. Hey, what's this? There's a kid outside the building knocking on my window. I hate to admit this, but uh, he's with me. A crazy fool. He could kill himself out there. And so Jack rode into the huge office on the giant's finger. What are you trying to do, kid? Blow the deal? Quiet, Benny. Let the kid speak his mind. Thank you. My name is Jack, and I have traveled long and hard seeking energy for a strong Yo Huppetsville. Benny, what's he talking about? His village is out of oil. Oh, well, why didn't you say so in the first place? I've got oil. What do you have, kid? A bag of beans, your giantness. Benny, get him out of here. Where's my fly squad? Consortium, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where Jack comes from, beans are gold. Right, Jack? Right, right. We say beans, you say gold. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Listen, giant. Um, we got a few more allegories to visit, so uh, if you could just give us your card, we'll be on our way. Sure thing, Benny. Don't be a stranger. We'll have to get together for lunch. <laughs> you. <laughs> He's got a great sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> what a kid. Hey, Jack, let's get out of here. When Jack and Benny reached the relative safety of the city streets, the intrepid avocado spoke to Jack. What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? You offer a guy like that a bag of beans? You trying to get us killed or something? Yeah, I'm real sorry, Benny. You crazy kid. There are other powers that be to see. See? So come on. Where are we going? To the park, Jack, to see the witch. Hey, cab! So the plucky pair piled into a cab and made it off for the park. And there, Jack beheld the witch Utopia. She was so beautiful, it was hard to believe she was really a witch. She wore faded denim jeans and hiking boots, offset by a clever Have a Nice Day t-shirt. As Jack and Benny approached, she was chanting a magic spell. Hey, this is really a witch. Hey, Utopia! Utopia! Come here, Benny. Come here. I want to... I want to talk to you. Benny, where have you been? We need you on the picket line. Who's your friend? Ah, uh, Utopia. I'd like you to meet Jack the Hero. Jack, meet Utopia. Hi. Hello. Uh, Utopia, my name is Jack, and uh, I, I come from the village of Uhuppetsville. I seek energy for my village. And then... Hey, no more, Jack. You've come to the right place. I have? Energy is no problem. Energy is everywhere. I am energy. You have energy. We are all energy. Utopia, that is really heavy stuff. Very deep. Oh, Benny, haven't you heard? I finally reached my alpha state. What are you two talking about? Oh, look around you, Jack. All that you see is energy. And do you know where that energy comes from? Batteries? Jack, you're such a hick. Of course energy doesn't come from batteries. Mm. It comes from mother sun, sister wind, and the ocean. The forces of nature surround us and still we do not see. Nature is the source, Jack. Go back to your village and tell them that their problem is solved. The witch raised her arms and was about to cast a spell on Jack and Benny when, just in the nick of time, two plain-clothed goblins descended on the witch and made a fuss. That was close, Benny. Yeah, yeah, she, uh... She changes her mind so many times, she's got a whole closet full of them. Yeah. Look, Benny, huh? why don't we just call the whole thing off, huh? You're discouraged. Yeah. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Listen, kid, never say die. I got another idea. I can hardly wait. You and I are going to visit the Dragon Nucleon. Well, I suppose it won't hurt to find out about all the possibilities. That's the idea, Jack. He lives on one mile island outside the city. And with that, Jack and Benny journeyed to the cave of the Dragon Nucleon, keeper of the reactor. The dragon was huge and spewed forth greasy hot fire when he spoke. Benny, my dear little green monster, I hear you're escorting the hero, Jack, around ozone. 
So, uh, what else is new, uh, garlic bread? Benny, Benny, Benny. <laughs> I do enjoy a sense of humor. <laughs> you would be wise to cultivate one. I realize you have been to the giant and the witch. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No luck, I presume. Well, Jack is, you know, considering all the offers. Oh, of course, Benny. By the by, where is your young friend? Just then, Jack leaped from the shadows, torch and spear in hand. Hold it right there, Nucleon. Benny? Yeah? That's the lad what he's doing. Hey, uh, Jack, uh, what are you doing? I'm making the dragon cower with fear. Jack. Yes? Do I look like I'm cowering with fear? I was wondering about that. You see, torches are supposed to make dragons cower with fear. Old wives' tales, my boy. Relax, Jack. <laughs> now, how many people will this reactor have to accommodate? And where is the construction site? I'm from Yohopitzville, across the Great Mountains. <laughs> Very great. The village has a population of 650. 650 what? Thousand? Million? Uh, just people, your dragonhood. People? That's correct. Of course, that doesn't include the outlying farm families. Well, let's make sure I understand you, Jack. You want me, Nucleon, keeper of the reactor, to bother with 650 people? Well, there are a lot of farm families. Hey, Jack, I, I think we better get out of here. I wouldn't hear of it. In fact, I was just going to have dinner. <laughs> Jack, Jack, Jack! He, he, he's overheating! Please away, friend. I'll cover you. Put, put down that spear, you half-baked magician! He's gonna blow! And so, in the confusion, Jack and Benny made their escape. That was close. You, you are gonna be the death of me yet, Kit. It looks like the only person who can help us now is uh, the wizard. Benny, do you mean... Don't say it. We're off to see the wizard? He said it. The wizard's castle stood proudly atop the mountain peak, its turrets gleaming golden in the evening sun. Hmm. Maybe nobody's home. No answer. Maybe we better go. No, no, no. No way, kid. Push on the door. It's awfully heavy, Benny. Yeah, what I could do if I had arms. Will you push harder, Jack? <laughs> Hello? Hey, just keep moving, kid. Let's let's check out that big gleaming golden door at the end of the hall. Jack put all his strength into pulling the great golden door open and beheld the magic orb for the first time. Oh, what is it, Benny? It, it looks like pay dirt to me. Glowing orb. That is pure energy, kid. <sighs> well, it's not exactly a golden heart, but I think the mayor and the villagers will be pleased with me. Hop smart. Your problems are over. Jack and the enchanted avocado moved closer to the bright glowing orb, drawn by its radiance and power. Jack raised his hands to pick it off the velvet cushion where it lay, when suddenly a great voice rang out. Who are you? And why do you darken my doorstep? Um... I, I, I am Jack from Yohuppetsville. I am the son of the Jack who stole the golden harp. Uh, perhaps you remember my father. I recall that one Will day... Will speed it up, kid? You know, I, I, anyway, my, my village sent me out into the world to search for energy. You see, we can't run our whiz-bangs. No one will have heat. People will be out of work. It's going to be awful. Because... Silence! Hmm. I am the great wizard, Infinito, master of the sublime powers of the universe. <laughs> Sounds like nice work if you can get it. We shall talk again soon. He's gone. Whew, well, Benny, I guess we better do what the man said. Benny? Benny? Jack, Benny, and the mayor are listening to Radio Yahuppetsville Expose of Energy, Inc. Sounds like things are about to get pretty serious. Andy Griffith again, and here's the concluding act of Jack and the Energy Crunch. Now, Jack felt truly alone. He wandered about the castle, searching for his friend, Benny. Soon, he found himself in a room filled with bubbling liquid in storage tubes and electric lights which flashed everywhere. Welcome to my laboratory, Jack. You're the wise guy. I met you at the beginning of my journey. Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid your journey was a little play to test you. The whole thing? 
Was it the giant to which the dragon was just a test? Well, yes. You mean you could have just told me to come to your castle, problem solved, that's it? We could have, Jack. We uh, just had to know a little more about you, Jack. Like what you're made of and like that. It was just a test. Danny, wait a minute. You and the wizard? He who pays, kid. Oh, I get it. You're just part of the make Jack look like a jerk test. No, you had to see the world as it really is. Yeah, you mean giants and witches and dragons? In a manner of speaking, oh. yes. If your village wants more energy, you're going to have to deal with creatures like that. Say, what about the glowing orb I saw when I came in here? Uh, come with me, Jack. The wizard led Jack down a secret passageway into the room where the golden orb lay glowing like a great gemstone on its velvet cushion. When I was a young wizard, I decided to try to find the ultimate source of energy for the benefit of mankind, of course. Well, I was young and headstrong and stupid enough. So sooner or later, thanks to my innate genius, in a couple of federal grants, I found it. Beautiful, wizard. My orb produces a never-ending supply of energy. It's clean, it's efficient, and it doesn't take a lot of space. What's more, you don't have to tear up national parks trying to find it. Good. Now I'll take it back to my village and be on my way. Oh, I'm afraid I cannot permit that, Jack. This source of energy is too dangerous. You mean you were going to give it to me and now you're not? Jack... If I were to give the orb to mankind, people would find a way to destroy themselves with it. I think you're a big stinker. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, Jack, but the orb stays here. Well, what about my quest? Go back and make a deal with the witch or the dragon or the giant. The best one you can get. That night, Jack lay awake in his room thinking of nothing but the golden orb. When the moon struck midnight, Jack heard a familiar sound at his door. Hey, Jack, open the door. Benny? Benny, come on in. Close the door. Listen, the wizard's got to give me the orb. With it, all of your Huppetsville's problems are over. Jack, the wizard isn't going to just hand you the orb. Then I'll steal it. Now you're talking, kid. Wait a minute, Benny. Just whose side are you on? I'm on my side, kid. That wizard is going nowhere fast. In the dead of night, Jack and Benny crept slowly down the dark hallways, trying to find their way to the room where the golden orb was kept. You got the bag, Jack? Yep. Okay, kid. There's your orb. Jack reached up to the velvet cushion and picked up the orb, which lay like a great golden egg in his hands. Quick, quick! Pop that thing into the bag and let's bam loose! The wizard will be far behind. Jack and Benny ran through the castle and down the mountain. The golden orb tucked safely under Jack's arm. Run faster, you fool! I'm running, I'm running. But strangely enough, the wizard did not come after them. The air of the evening was cold, and there was a strange chill about. When Jack and Benny finally reached the foot of the mountain, they looked up to see the wizard's castle glowing ominously. Without a second thought, they ran very far, very fast. Well, Benny... It looks like my journey is over. I have the orb, the new energy source. The villagers will make me a hero just like my dad and give me a trophy. What? You telling me you're going through all of this just for a measly trophy? Yeah. That's pretty cheap, isn't it? Jack. Jack, my boy. Have you ever played poker? So Benny pulled out a packet of enchanted symbols he called playing cards and taught Jack a magic ritual called putting on the poker face. At sunrise, Jack and the crusty avocado resumed their journey and soon found themselves back at One Mile Island, home of the dread dragon, Nucleon. Now remember what I told you, kid. Uh -huh. Now, push the button. Jack, back so soon? Yeah, Nuke, it's me, Jack. Well, well, my fine fellow, I knew you'd be back. Can't do anything without me, eh? I have got the exclusive on the wizard's glowing orb. I see. Why play games? I got the secret source that's going to put you out of business. Now, if you're nice to me, I'll give you a pension and call it a deal. Or perhaps you'd like to spend the rest of your days as a glowing pile of unwanted waste matter. Very well, Jack. I'm sure we can come to some sort of agreement. <laughs> yes, I'm sure we can. We'll have to have lunch sometime and uh, discuss it. Then, Jack and Benny journeyed to the park to visit the witch Utopia. You pesky little creature. Get out of my protest, Mark. Now, listen, witch. 
This orb in my pocket's got it all. It's clean, it's pure, and it's forever. You did? And I have the exclusive. Well, Jack, maybe we should have a talk after all. Uh, no time now. Call or send an emissary to Energy Incorporated, 316 Beanstalk Drive, Yohoppetsville. And you'll give me all the energy I want? Well, let's just say we'll begin preliminary price negotiations. Ciao. Finally, Jack and the worldly avocado went to the monolith tower to visit Consortium, the giant. See, fi fo fum I smell the blood of a Yohuppet's man. That's right, blubber brain. I just happen to have an exclusive on the wizard's magic orb. <laughs> Old smorb. Want to see it, Mr. Giant Consortium? What's your price? Now you close up shop and get out of town. <laughs> and if I refuse? See that mountain over there? Yeah. It works. Now, after he had finished with the three powers, Jack took Benny on the road back to Yohuppetsville. They journeyed until they came to the spot by the brook where Jack had first encountered the wise guy. Jack took Benny out of his knapsack and laid him on a rock. Well, Benny, looks like we've come to a parting of the ways. I'll take the ore back to my world, and you can go back to yours. Jack, I taught you everything you know. You can't do this to me. I got one crazy wizard ready to turn me into Mexican hors d'oeuvres. I risk my life for you. I suppose you'll be wanting a cut of the action. Listen, kid. I'm your friend, remember? Okay, okay. I'll make you a vice president in charge of something. So it came to pass that Jack and the plucky avocado returned to your Huppetsville. It was a sad homecoming. Piles of unused whiz-bangs lined the tattered streets. People walked about like zombies, pining for their toys, discarded for lack of energy. Jack and Benny went directly to the mayor's office and found him sitting in a loincloth, eating berries. Jack, you're back. I got the juice and we're ready to roll. It's about time. Now, I'm going to need some office space, some secretaries, a new car. Uh, and... Jack, first. We've got to have a ceremony. So Jack took the golden orb into the town square and set it up for all the villagers to see. People limped in from miles around to see the magical orb. Citizens of Yo Huppetsville, Jack the Hero has returned from his quest, and he brings energy for a strong Yo Huppetsville. Yeah. Jack. When you left on your journey, I promised you a trophy, if ever you returned. I hereby present you with this trophy. Um. <laughs> uh, read the inscription. To the best bowling team ever, Al. Gee, thanks, Mayor. And now, I'll take possession of the orb. Not so fast, Your Honor. Who said that? I did. Mayor, people of your Huppetsville, this is my friend and fellow hero, Benny the Avocado. Without him, I would never have been able to find the solution to our problem. But now that we've found it, I'd like to say there's going to be a few changes around this place. And so there were. Jack and Benny set up shop in a humble cottage on Beanstalk Drive. As the years passed, the monolith tower of Energy Incorporated was built stone by stone, floor by floor. Jack had cornered the world market for energy, and he used his position ruthlessly. The innocent youth who had set out on a search for energy had become a despot, a tyrant, whose prices went up just as his personal morality went down. He ignored reformers' accusations of price gouging and sent his spies to cut down all who resisted him. Some say that all fairy tales end happily. And if that is true, this story is no longer a fairy tale. It is our plight. Jack the Orb and You has been a special presentation of Radio Yohuppetsville News. Good night, everyone. Somebody turn that thing off. Mayor, I want you to get me the head of Radio Yohuppetsville. On a tray, sir? Just bring him here, you incompetent. Jack, not Jack, just be Look, time. Benny, I won't do anything serious. I'll just make him into chopped liver. Uh, let's all be calm. Uh, maybe it's time to share power with the people. Yeah, yeah, that's it. The, the People's Orb Corporation, it's a great angle. No, no, no. The orb is mine. If they don't like it, I'll crush them. I'll crush them all. It's the wizard. What are you doing here, old man? Get out of my office. No, Jack, it's all over. I've come to collect. What are you talking about? The orb, Jack. 
You misused it. You took the perfect source of energy and you ruined everything. You can't do this. The orb. It just appeared in his hand. The orb belongs to me. Give it back. Give it back. Good luck, Jack. Jenny. What did he mean, good luck? Take a look out the window, Jack. They're coming for me. Let me out of here. I have some business at my office that's been piling up. Help! Jack, Radio Yohepetville News here. Would you like to comment on tonight's report? Uh, I would like to say that I had nothing to do with any of this. But he can't. He's in up to his... uh, Whatever. Now, uh, I was used from the start. Get away from me. Get out. Everybody, get out. Well, that's our story. And it just goes to show that you never mess around with the universal source of energy. The Sears Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears. Where America shops for value. Jack and the Energy Crunch was written by Michael Utvich and Michael Gelman. Produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Andy Griffith. Our stars were Les Tremaine, Robert Towers, and Jesse White. Featured in the cast were Linda K. Henning, Elliot Reed, Dawes Butler, William Woodson, and Ed Mack. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Tomorrow's Sears Radio Theater will be a mystery with Vincent Price as your host. Let's listen. Just think she left here a nobody and returned only a few years later as a national celebrity. You must be mighty proud of her. I am. And of her marriage. She'd have stayed around here. She might have wound up marrying a real louse. So be sure and tune in tomorrow to Sears Radio Theater. CBS News. Skylab is coming home, and the latest time appears to be between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. This is John Bohannon reporting on the CBS Radio Network. Throughout today, America's unmanned space station dropped about half a mile an hour. And late tomorrow morning, the space station should be 75 miles above the Pacific Northwest. Skylab will break into pieces as it burns up in the atmosphere, and some parts are expected to hit Earth. NASA says most should come down in the Atlantic. Noon Eastern time seems to be the most likely time. At the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Eric Engberg reports on some people with a special interest in the spacecraft. To most people, the Skylab is now just a potentially harmful piece of junk. But there are nine men who once called it home the members of the three crews which lived aboard the space station in 1973 and 74. One of them, scientist astronaut Owen Garriott, spent two months in Skylab. He says he feels neither sentimental nor concerned about its demise. Um, It is uh, uh, appropriate, I think, that uh, when we finish with one activity, we turn and look ahead for what's uh, the next step going to be. And uh, the uh, problems associated with the uh, reentry of Skylab, I think, have been uh, largely exaggerated. And uh, perhaps in another 24 hours, we'll find out whether or not uh, there is really as much concern as uh, some of the uh, press seems to think there should be. Rather than think about Skylab N, Garriott says he prefers to remember the scientific information it gathered and the beautiful sunsets he was able to see from the craft that was then and is, for a few more hours at least, the largest object man has ever sent into space. Eric Engberg, CBS News, at the Johnson Space Center. Some people who walked through Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico earlier today had to wait a while to get out because of four men with rifles and shotguns. They took over the underground lunchroom, and for a while, they held a cavern employee hostage. Reports just reaching CBS News say the men have now surrendered. Four men have given themselves up to authorities. They have been demanding a million dollars and a plane to take them to Brazil. There are no reports of anyone being hurt. CBS News correspondent Don Webster reports from Managua that President Somoza of Nicaragua is ready to resign. Webster says Somoza is blaming communist influences in Cuba and other areas for forcing his resignation. There are reports that Somoza may be planning to settle in Miami, but there's no confirmation of that. The National Hurricane Center says Hurricane Bob is now about 300 miles south-southwest of New Orleans. It's heading toward the north-northeast at 12 to 15 miles an hour. 
Forecasters say the hurricane could hit the coast of Louisiana west of Grand Isle between 6 a.m. and noon tomorrow, Eastern Time. President Carter declared an energy emergency today and ordered operators of all public and commercial buildings in America to set thermostats at 78 and no cooler. The order is effective Monday and will last for three months. If Mr. Carter extends it into the winter, the order would be thermostat settings at 65. A petroleum newsletter, the Independent Oil Buyer's Guide in Lakewood, New Jersey, predicts that Americans will have ample supplies of home heating oil this winter, and the newsletter says Americans can also expect more gasoline at service stations. In Sunnyvale, California, a police officer got out of his car to investigate two unleashed dogs, pit bull terriers. But the dogs decided to investigate the officer. Back in his patrol car, he radioed for help while the dogs chewed up his tires. Their owners says the dogs are really friendly, but they just...